Yeah, yeah, it looks good. All right, um, and I am going to record this because um, we do have a Washington Surfrider YouTube channel where I've been recording all of the different chapter meetings uh, and presentations so that people who aren't able to attend in real time can still view them. Um, so if you don't want your face, I don't know how many of your faces will be on the recording, um, but I can't guarantee they won't be. So if you don't want your face on the recording for whatever reason, um, feel free to go ahead and turn your camera off now. Um, and I'm gonna get to it. All right, so we're gonna shed some light on seabed mining. I'm gonna kind of go over what it is, um, and then Lee will kind of cover um, how it's gonna affect our coasts, theoretically, um, and sort of what we're doing about it. Uh, so I'll let Lee kind of, well, Lee, you already kind of introduced yourself. Do you wanna do it again? No. Okay, cool. The Twin Harbors Waterkeepers does a lot of really cool stuff, and Lee is a powerhouse of information and activism that I just aspire to be when I grow up. Um, and most of you are familiar with Surfrider, so I'll skip over that. Um, some of these slides are meant for non-Surfrider chapter um, presentations. So moving on. So Lee found this really great quote by Sylvia Earle, who is a renowned oceanographer and just overall like woman and badass and explorer. Um, and I really like this slide because it kind of speaks to the fact that, <clears throat> you know, history is fraught with hard-earned lessons learn about destroying that which we do not really understand or, or know and the deep sea definitely constitutes like something we don't fully understand um, and so i like it because it sort of really emphasizes the need for us to take a precautionary principle uh, both within our state and also as like a global community uh, when it comes to this extractive process so what is it um, so simply it is the extraction of minerals and metals from the sea floor um, I'm going to be speaking about um, a lot of more deeper sea mining, which is usually 200 meters or deeper, about a little over 600 feet deep. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the industrial removal of a lot of hard minerals and metals. Um, there is other types of seafloor mining, um, including sort of sea, um, sort of shallow seabed mining, which involves like shell and gravel and sand extraction, which is used for beach renourishment, um, which has its own suite of issues and things that we could go on and on about, but, um, and that's been around for decades and I'm not really gonna be speaking to that. Um, I'm gonna be talking about extracting the hard minerals from the deep sea floor. Um, so I just wanted to make that distinction. Um, so when you're looking to these deep sea minerals, um, they sort of occur in three different places um, within the deep sea ecosystem. And so the first form um, are manganese nodules, which are basically these potato-sized rocks that are just sitting around on what's called the abyssal plain, um, which is vast, empty stretches of, you know, sand and, and silt um, out in the middle of the ocean. Um, and they grow incredibly slowly. Um, and so to harvest these, and they, they contain manganese and copper and nickel, um, and importantly, they often contain a lot of cobalt and lithium, um, and those are really important elements for uh, things like batteries and a lot of our electronic devices. And um, to harvest them, you simply just kind of pick them up off of the seabed, which doesn't seem that destructive, um, but it's still actually, it has a pretty significant impact on those ecosystems because these nodules are the only hard substrate around for these creatures to sort of um, grow off of. And so when you remove that hard substrate, there's just nothing for them to attach to. And you can see the bottom, um, this bottom picture here is like a coral or a sponge that's growing attached to one of these nodules. And you can see all the different life forms that are then growing on top of that. And so you have this whole ecosystem that depends on something hard to grow on. And so when you remove these nodules, you're removing that. And so you're gonna have a severe, severe impact to the biodiversity there. And there's also some issues with sediment plumes, but we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, another type of resource that we would be mining would be these cobalt rich crusts. Um, and so you can see here, they're just, you know, that's the hard substrate that is often located on the top of sea mounts, which are underwater mountains. Um, you can see here this like thick metal crust. And so to harvest these, you basically have to plow that whole crust up. So that's gonna be um, a little bit more devastating to those ecosystems. Um, which is alarming because sea, uh, sea mounts are incredibly important hot spots of biodiversity out in the open ocean. Um, they're sort of like oases where 
a lot of cold, oxygen dense and nutrient rich water will hit these seamounts and um, shoot up to the surface in what's called upwelling. And upwelling feeds a lot of primary productivity and attracts all sorts of creatures all up, through, up the, the food chain. So like dolphins and sharks, they're really important for commercial fisheries. Um, and so plowing these is basically gonna be like mountaintop removal underwater. Um, and while this has not happened anywhere yet, because this is a pretty new industry that's just starting to get going, um, we can look to deep sea fishing and how the impacts of just dragging a net along these seamounts can be very devastating and very long-term and have very long-term effects. Um, and so you can only imagine what actually plowing up the crust of the seamount would, would do to those ecosystems. And finally, we have what are called seafloor massive sulfides. And so these are hard mineral-based chimneys, kind of, that grow up around these deep sea hydrothermal vents, um, which are really cool because um, they're, these are chemosynthetic ecosystems. So most of the life on Earth that we know about is photo, like derives its energy from the sun. Um, but these ecosystems derive their energy from the minerals and the heat that's just coming out of like the core of the earth. And some scientists think that this is where life on earth actually evolved. Um, and so in order to harvest these, which are full of a lot of um, metals like copper and silver and gold, you have to smash them over and, or excuse me, topple them over and smash them up and kind of bring them to the surface and process them. Um, and so you can imagine that that is also going to be very destructive with a lot of consequences to those to those ecosystems which can be pretty diverse and very unique and you can just see all the like colorful life forms and weird weird stuff that like you know science fiction sort of level creature, creatures that grow on these things and so um, that is another source of these minerals that um, you know are being targeted I think that's all I have to say Lee do you want to kick in here or do you want me to keep going no, I'll kick in here. Thank you, Liz. And I'm, it's going to take me a second. I'll share my screen and then. Any questions so far? Can you pull that up? Sweet. Success. Yeah, so thank you, Liz. That's great. Um, as Liz said, I'm your Twin Harbors waterkeeper out on the coast. And it's, um, it's really a pleasure working with Liz and Gus. And um, I just moved to Olympia, so I hope I can meet some of you too in the near future. So this slide shows some of those sea mounts or underwater mountains that, that Liz talked about. And it also shows what some of the equipment that will be used for deep sea mining looks like. There, there's like a big dredge barge up at the top and then hard piping down to the seafloor where there's some kind of tractor with a big uh, vacuum will operate and then smaller tractor type things will be up there crushing the the top of the seamounts and so you can just imagine or um, think about what running huge machines on the seafloor will do you know not only will it crush all those animals and plants that Liz talked about, but it'll, it'll ruin the diversity of habitat and the sediment. Um, the, there'll be sediment generated both at the very bottom of the seafloor and then from that um, dredge barge, they, they pump the, the all the material um, will, will be pumped up to, to the dredge barge where, where it will be separated out and the minerals that they want will, will be taken out and then the, um, the rest of the stuff that they don't want will be, will be pumped back down. And so that's going to cause a huge turbidity plume or dewatering plume that's going to get in the way of animals that are migrating and, um, you know, fish can't tolerate turbidity. They, it clogs their gills. Um, it makes it impossible to breathe. Um, so, you know, this, this type of activity will be very noisy. Um, a lot of these, um, it, the dewatering plume could be warmer. Um, it's, it could ruin the fishing industry and other, um, you know, it could have effects on recreation when it's in the, in the near shore. Um, so, you know, this, this is just a potential disaster and that's why we're out here trying to spread the word about this and, um, trying to, um, 
educate people to try to get this stopped. So this is a cool slide that Liz found. And um, this is an experiment that was conducted um, in 1989 off the coast of Peru. And this is called the Discol experiment, where they brought tractors down to the seafloor um, 4,000 meters deep. And they plowed three and a half kilometer wide swaths of the seabed with a plow and harrow. And um, over on the right hand side on the top, that shows what, what that plowing looked like 28 years later. So, you know, this, um, it's likely that in some areas, this kind of damage would, would last, you know, centuries. You know, nobody knows how, how long this will last. So, um, scientists found that significant long term effects included um, reduced microbes, which are essential to, for carbon recycling, and, and that those microbes were reduced by more than one third. So this is one of the few studies that we have. And that's another problem. We, there, there's been so few studies that we don't know what the damage is. You know, we, um, and, that's, and that's why we just wanna get this stopped before it start, starts. So green technology is, is, is the big driver for these resources, car batteries, cell phones, wind turbines, and the like. Um, the, the mineral deposits that we have on land are, are coming under increasing pressure because of the need to serve a continuously growing population and expanding in middle class and the need for renewable low carbon infrastructure. On earth, the amount of easily mined high grade ore deposits are declining. Increased recycling of metals will help provide some relief, but will probably not be sufficient to satisfy the anticipated long-term growth in demand. So deep sea, mi deep sea minerals are therefore increasingly likely to make an important contribution to sustainable de development, particularly for those countries that lack secure sources of supply on land and small island developing states that lack opportunities for economic development. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the resources that we're talking about are located in international waters that are governed by the International Seabed Authority, which is also called the ISA. And all parties to the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea are members of this authority. Its primary function is to regulate exploration for and explo exploitation of deep sea m minerals found in the seabed and some subsoil beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. Um, I want to talk about phosphorus. I've been studying this and um, there is a mineral called phosphite that is found in the deep sea. And um, it's really, phosphorus is really interesting because it comes from continental weathering and it's brought out to the rivers by, brought out by rivers to the ocean. It then accumulates on the ocean floor and accumulation occurs from atmospheric precipitation, dust, glacial runoff, cosmic activity, and underground hydrothermal volcanic activity. And so the predominant source of phosphorus from the earth is phosphate rock. And according to some researchers, the earth's commercial and affordable phosphorus reserves are expected to be depleted in 50 or 100 years and peak phosphorus will be reached in approximately 2030, which is right around the bend. So peak phosphorus is a concept is, you know, we've all heard of peak oil. So peak phosphorus describes the point in time when humanity reaches the maximum global production rate of phosphorus as an industrial 
and commercial raw material. And the reason that this is so important is it's the phosphorus is, is the number one ingredient in, in fertilizer. So, you know, this rock phosphate, when it runs out, it, there's going to be even more pressure to mine this from the ocean. Um, and, you know, so, so this mining is going to, has a direct effect on, on our food supply. And although a lot of phosphate has been mined on land, it's, the focus is now going to, going to turn to the ocean. And so this brings us to a linear economy versus a circular e e economy. Forestry is an example of a linear economy. The raw materials are cut, extracted, and then processed in, into a product that we use and then usually throw away at some point. You could also call this a cradle to grave system. In a circular economy, raw materials enter a cycle where their value is maintained throughout its life cycle. So an example of this is um, you buy a new phone. You use it until it starts to act weird or you just get tired of it. Then you toss it out and buy another. It, it goes in, into the garbage. Whereas in a circular economy, instead of buying a phone, you, you lease the use of a phone. When it no longer works, you trade it in or the owner fixes it and sends it back. The phone can be repaired, remanufactured or recycled. And the, the owner that you leased it from retains the ownership of the materials and then is encouraged to reuse them indefinitely. Um, this is a map and let's take note of a few things here. So that discall experiment, you can see where that happened off the coast of Peru. Um, and then you can also see these these orange dots. So these are um, where the polymetallic sulfide deposits occur, where the mineral and metal rich superheated water hits the cold ocean water. So those are those really cool um, underwater vent things that, that Liz showed us. Um, Sometimes there can be structures that are next to fracture zones that are re a result of the fluid released. And there is one in the Atlantic known as the Lost City, where ca calcium car carbonate instead of sulfide that is fueled by rock we weathering rather than superheated water and elements from the seafloor. And then um, there's Solwara 1, is actually the first proposed deep sea mine in, in the Pacific, um, where a, I believe it's a German company, Nautilus Minerals, is planning to extract high grade seafloor massive sulfides, and which include deposits of copper, gold, zinc, and silver in the water off the coast of New Guinea. And, it, and there's, so this, this has a permit to do some mining now, but it hasn't started. And in New Guinea, there's a huge, there's a lot of protests that are going on to, to try to stop this. So my area of the coast is the Chehalis watershed, Grays Harbor, and um, Willapa Bay, and all the rivers that drain into those, those estuaries. And, um, in 1960, there was a study of the, of the sediment in Grace Harbor and in the Columbia River estuary that showed that there was lo lots of accumulations of black mineral sands. So black sand beaches or black sands are made from basalt, either from fresh lava ground by the ocean in the fine bits and they are of particular interest to ocean miners because they contain iron, gold, platinum, and titanium. Um, so th this is a uh, this is scary because this is in you know it's in our state, and it could cause a huge amount of damage. It could interfere with recreation. You know th these two estuaries. Um, Grays Harbor and Willapa Bay are, are where 25% of the oysters are grown. 
in in the in the country and you know there's our there's already so many other pressures of pollution you know of fish being depleted you know different kinds of economy that you know we need good water quality here um so this shows what is um what what the state what the what part of the the water is under the jurisdiction of the washington state department of natural resources so you can see the the pink here is washington state waters and then there's some oregon state waters um oregon has banned seabed mining um and california is is working to do that so we're we're a little behind and um the definition of washington state waters is extreme low tide to three miles out and to per be perfectly honest i don't know why puget sound has you know there must be other protections in in parts of puget sound there and and i've been told by our partners at pew charitable trusts that puget sound itself is not under um, as much of a risk to seabed mining as 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 coastal waters um, and also um, the NOAA or the Office of Na National Marine Sanctuaries does protect some areas including the the north coast of Washington and parts of Puget Sound So Liz found this picture. This is really cool. This is what one of those nodules actually looks like. And um, so these are one of the most valuable things that they want to pick up off, off the ocean floor. They're considered to be the most important deposit of metals and other minerals in the sea. They, are, they, they're, they range from a size of a potato to a head of lettuce and contain mainly manganese, as their name suggests, but also iron, nickel, copper, titanium, and cobalt. They're of special interest because of these minerals, or, or, or because the, many of those minerals, the, the supply is starting to dwindle on land, and it is assumed that the worldwide manganese nodule occurrences contain significantly significantly more manganese than the reserves on on the land so what what can you do i think you guys all have a lot of good ideas the 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 restaurants that are ocean friendly um you know try to support the circular economy um do as much reducing reusing and just not buying new items that contain these rare metals uh, and support the organizations that that work on these kind of issues and i know you guys or liz has gotten a whole bunch of business sign-ons but we do have this business sign-on letter that's on the surf rider website and um we're gonna um we're gonna try to get just a a sign-on letter for people and that should be coming out soon and then at some point we're gonna we're gonna probably not this year because there's so much budget um issues with the state but at some point probably in 2022 we'll start working the legislature to um to take the first steps to ban seabed mining and i just had to show this um i've been kind of a, a mining anti-mining for years and this is a zinc mine in China. Um, and you know, there's there's some companies there. There's a lot of of huge mines in Africa, in China, in India, Australia, the United States that that have just um, done so much damage. And um, so, and on land, you you can go look at at least you can look at the mine you can see it from the air you can you know these mines have to have permits that regulate the 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 water discharge you know that say that you can't you know we've got the clean water act we can we can enforce or just try to enforce the laws that are that protect the water but 
imagine trying to do that 4,000 feet down. You know, you, you won't be able to see it. You won't be able to go there. You know, you, who's to trust that they're doing it like they're supposed to do it? You know, it's a huge unknown. Um, so I just found this. Yeah, there was an eight year study that in China in 2014, it concluded and they said that 20% of the country's farmland was contaminated from mining and a third of its surface water is unfit for human contact because of mining. So that's pretty much it. Liz and I would love to hear more from you and your friends. So send us an email if, if you wanna learn more about Twin Harbors Waterkeeper um, and what we're working on some plastic projects. We're working to try to prevent the, the, dam, the dam on the headwaters of the Shales River. And, you know, Grace Harbor has 150 toxic cleanup sites. And, um, and I'm working on a lot of outreach about that. Um, so if you'd like to stay in touch with us, we do have a monthly newsletter. Um, and Liz and I have a one pager with a bunch of references and articles about um, seabed mining. So um, I think that's it. We got one more. These are pelicans that I, uh, have seen a few times out in the north shore of Grays Harbor where the Hump Tulips River comes comes into the north bay of Grays Harbor. So we just want to um, thank the, our partners at Pew Charitable Trusts and and I want to thank Liz and Surfrider who are a great partner in this outreach project. Sweet. Sweet. Thanks Lee. You're welcome. All right, I did put a link to the blog post that we that I wrote that um, has a link to the seabed mining sign oh, uh, oh, in the chat room. So if you are a business owner or know business owners that think that they don't want seabed mining in our state waters, uh, please feel free to share that far and wide. It only takes like a few seconds only... to sign on, but yeah. Do you do any of you guys patronize businesses out in Westport? Because it'd be great to have some of them sign on yeah we're and and so maybe one uh, um blog post a uh, one sheet up something like that would be great if we could print out and when we're out that way just kind of okay. dropping in and handing okay, them yeah. out and having yeah. literature that's awesome yeah no that's a great idea i'll, I'll work on we can work on that thank you jill well, no, I don't want to make some, I don't want to put some on your plate. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's just easy to cut and paste stuff. I've already like concise it up and make it pretty. Yeah. That's fun for me. Make it pretty. <laughs> That's pretty good. Fun. So I created good work, but yeah, if there was like a, you know, yeah, just even a, a you know, a sh half sheet or something with the information and we're popping into, to businesses in Westport and Aberdeen, it's super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I always forget about like non-digital communications in this time. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I know. thing, people exchanging good. So, uh, but right on. I did want to say that um, just an interesting side thing. Um, so she was talking about the International Seabed Authority, um, and the United Nations has the Na the conventions on the law of the sea, which is like over 120 uh, countries that have, you know, they work together on how to manage international waters and the resources there. And the U.S. has actually never ratified that for reasons that I don't fully understand. Um, but one of the, I don't know if you've heard, um, the congressional leaders have introduced uh, an act called the Ocean Climate Solutions Act that covers a bunch of things like coastal blue carbon and all sorts of, you know, climate solutions that are ocean focused. Um, and one of them involves uh, ratifying the the law of the sea and so we would be a player you know we'd have a seat at that table um, and and the law of the sea like the ISA that regulates seabed mining is nested under um, that international law of the sea and so that would give us a little bit more um, say I think in how these resources are managed um, globally not just you know federally in in our state waters so we'll see we'll see what happens any other questions? I don't think so. 
was the uh, <clears throat> was the was the goal to to try to do the same thing? I know with offshore oil drilling, surf rider, I think they were successful in uh, at least at least Oregon in actually getting. It, was it the governor's office or or the? I, I can't remember how they how they got this ban sort of adopted is, is it what is there a is there a what's the avenue to doing that in washington does that make sense for offshore drilling or for seabed mining no for seabed mining yeah so i wish gus was here because he's much more fluent in this but um basically we he's been in like contact with legislators who would like propose you know they'd bring it to the table kind of deal and and bring it to a vote. Um, and so I do think we have um, individuals willing to sort of like um, represent that bill were it to, to be written up and, and drafted. Um, I'm not sure how it went down in Oregon. They banned it in like the 90s. Like it's been a long time. Um, and I'm not sure why, like what precipitated that um, because this is, this is an industry that hasn't really been a threat. Like we've known that the resources are down there, but it just hasn't been viable, like financially viable to like, go get them. And that's just now starting to be true as we deplete um, terrestrial sources and the demand goes up. And so I don't know what precipitated that decision in Oregon, um, but we're hoping to at least get the ban in Washington state. Um, and we're hopeful, it, it still might happen this year. Um, nothing is certain this year because the legislative session is going to be really abbreviated and weird and virtual, um, but it doesn't have like a line item on it. And so you know, we're not holding out hope for any bills or legislation we want to pass that's going to cost the state money because times are tough right now. Um, but seabed mining, it, you know, it would be a pretty simple cut and dry decision. Um, so, and, you know, honestly, like there aren't, we don't really know how many resources are even out there. Like it's really hard. Well, I don't, I should say. Um, the like surveying that sort of stuff is expensive and it's not, like the, the black sands that Lee was talking about, that's from a report from the 60s, you know? So like finding out what's even out there is pretty, it's been pretty challenging. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know how much, you know, is even out there to, to lure people into wanting to explore it and, and extract it. Um, so it, I don't think there'd be a lot of opposition, I guess I should say, to the, to the ban we're proposing is I, what I'm trying to get at. What has uh, Canada or BC done? Have they done anything? Uh, you know, I just researched this. I think they are in the process of federally regulating it. Um, I think that's what I remember seeing. I think Trudeau put out a thing that's like, we're gonna, I don't know if it's an outright ban or as much as it's like, we need some regulations um, because we don't, we don't really have like regulation. <laughs> like it's all unknown. Like in Washington, if you wanted to go deep sea mine, you could put in a permit to, I think, DNR, because they manage our aquatic lands, and they'd sort of assess it on a case-by-case -case basis, but they don't have any, like, protocols or, uh, you know, regulations set up specifically for that. And so um, I, I think Canada's, I think it's in the same situation, and they're, they're working on it as well. But I can try to Google that real quick. I know. And, and of course, Alaska has a long history of dredging. Uh, yeah even along the, the shorelines for gold. Yep. Is that, now do they industrially dredge or is that all like? like well, I think they used to. I don't know if they do now or not. Yeah. yeah I don't even, I don't even know. There's definitely some resources off of in Alaska, Alaskan coasts, I believe too. So. And the other good thing is that like, you know, we don't want it in our coastal waters because that's like a definite threat. The sediment plumes in particular, um, it's hard to predict how far they will travel. Most of the modeling has been on the uh, extraction site plume, which doesn't go as far. Um, it's a lot more challenging to model the dewatering plume, which is released somewhere in the water column, who knows where. Um, and it's hard to model, figure out like, just how far the, that sediment plume will go, because some of it will settle and sink, and some of it will get dissolved and travel much further. <laughs> Um, the only numbers I found was like at least 100, like 10 to, 10 to 100 kilometers. Um, so that's, that's still pretty far out um, that they could harvest these resources in our, in our federal waters and it would still impact our coastal areas um, with those sediment plumes. So. Uh, 
Um, you, you know, when you think about Grays Harbor, there's already a lot of dredging there because they dredge the shipping channel to be able to get the big tankers in and out. And, and that's been proven to have some bad effects on the shoreline and um, the, the number and of crab and um, some of the oyster beds have a lot of sediment that they didn't used to have before this dredging of the navigation channel. So um, if they ever did go after the black sands in Grays Harbor, it would just, it, it, it would be a disaster. It would definitely be a disaster. It's sort of like if, if mine tailings could be like yeah. launched into the atmosphere is how I compare it. Like we all know mine tailings suck. There's nothing good about them. And so if they were like <laughs> paralyzed and spread far and wide to be like, oh no. Right. Um, and like what's even more alarming is like, you know, mining companies get away with a lot of sketchy, sketchy things sometimes because people just don't go look at them. And so when you're looking at the deep sea, like you can get away with anything. Like nobody's monitoring that. You can't just like pop in and check for a site visit. You know, you got to like, send a submersible down <laughs> um, and so like the our ability to regulate it um, and enforce those regulations is also sort of like mm, don't just take your word for it mining companies that you're doing what you say you're gonna do so yeah pretty fun stuff yeehaw yeah the cool <laughs> thing is though is that like I, I do like to end on a positive note and and it's like most of our work as environmentalists and conservationists is like cleaning up the mess that we've made. Um, and this is really <clears throat> an interesting campaign to me because like we have a chance to like get ahead of something horrible before it happens. And so to me, that's like pretty exciting. You're like, oh, we can, we can stop this before we have to like deal with the consequences, which could be potentially very widespread and devastating. And so um, that to me is, it's, it's kind of enjoyable to work on something. Uh, preventative for once. Yeah, and one thing I forgot to mention is that we, we've we messed up a lot of the earth from all kinds of terrible, um, especially mining and all kinds of forestry. Um, um, and so we've, we have learned how to restore a lot of that damage, but you know, there's no way we can restore the kind of damage that seabed mining would cause. You know, we, yeah, we don't even know what's, down, know what's there, down there, let yeah. alone how to like fix it if we break it. So, um, but the cool thing is that metals are infinitely recyclable. And I know we do a lot with plastics and like plastic recycling is sort of like not a real solution right now because you can only recycle plastic once or twice and then it's like kind of worthless. It's no longer a viable product. Um, but metal, if you design your products for their end of life to, to be easy to extract that metal back out of them in a circular economy, you can recycle that metal infinitely because it's like a pure element that you can like heat up and use over and over again without it degrading. And so um, there are like differing ideas on if we can use recycling and trust resources to supply the increasing demand. Um, some say yes, some say no, we have to mine the deep. Um, but I don't know the answer to that question. So sort of on that note, are there resources for things like tool libraries or Right. Um, across the state, because I know that there's a tool library in Seattle, but like, how could we on the ground start to support circular economies where you just reuse stuff and turn it back in? You know, that is an excellent question. And I, I don't have a good answer. I know, like, obviously supporting certain like bills. So like right now, we're working, we're like the Plastic Pollution Coalition is a bunch of partners that are working on an extended producer responsibility bill. Um, and so, you know, they have to pay for the products like the plastic bottles and stuff that they're cranking out into the environment. And so suddenly they are incentivized to do things like bottle collection and things like that because otherwise they're, they're footing the bill with all the, you know, marine debris and trash and stuff that these products create. And so, I think to get there, it's just going to take a multi-pronged approach of like incrementally modifying like the incentives and the economic systems that we work under um, to just sort of push towards that. And a lot of it is going to have to be innovation and redesign. Like I used to teach sustainability and we'd be like, reduce, reuse, recycle, but like redesign so you don't need to recycle, you know, like so 
making making our products more efficient and making their end of life um, you know a product in itself instead of just a landfill is I don't know how I get there. <laughs> yeah. Well, in in Germany, um, there is a there's a legal requirement to recycle end of life vehicles, mm -hmm. and BMW has has kind of taken the lead on that. They um, they they even are able to recycle the plastic that's in the vehicles, and the, and they are working to make the components um, easier to recycle. Um, so Germany has, has a quota that 85% of materials are supposed to be reused or recycled. And I don't know if that's enforced, um, but BMW is kind of taking the lead as far as cars go. Yeah. Yeah, it's just top-down regulation, but also we have to change our culture from like, we're a throwaway culture, you know, we're, especially in the US here and a lot of other developed countries, especially it's like, you know, you, you use something quickly for convenience and then you toss it out and you don't give a lot of thought to it. And we need to change that lack of thought to like being aware. Um, and so, you know, changing culture in your town, in your family, with your friends, like that is all incredibly helpful too, um, while also pushing the top to regulate industry so that, you know, they're incentivized to, to deal with these, these issues. I'm sure there's a lot better information on the internet about how to implement a circular economy. <laughs> I'm all about it though. Cradle to Cradle is a great book to start with. Um, it's pretty old at this point, but that's a good one. And then I also recommend um, Paul Hawkins is a really good author that talks about things like uh, natural capitalism, um, where if we were able to incorporate externalized costs into a market system, then the market will sort of write itself. And so, you know, if your product comes with severe environmental or um social justice like externalities basically like your you know sweatshops or environmental degradation like your product should cost more because that cost is being borne by society um so if we can create those systems and sort of adjust our economic systems i think that's that would be a really feasible way i think to implement implement some of that but i was Sounds like and made better decisions huh but it sounds like a utopia. Right? It's like capitalism can work. We just gotta fix it. <laughs> it's really broken. I don't know. I'm not an economist, so I just, you know, have read some of these books. And so I do find hope in them, I guess I should say. And today is a hopeful day because I, I think I heard just recently that the the Pebble Mine was what? Yeah, the, pe the permit on the Pebble Mine was denied by the Corps of Engineers. That, that warms my soul. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm giving thanks on this day <laughs> for that news because that's a battle that's been fought and won and fought again and won and yeah. hopefully it will stay. Stay won this time. I think those, those mining that mining company got busted being like, yeah, we're actually going to mine way more than we said we were. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I think they got caught doing some dodgy, <laughs> dodgy things behind the scenes. So I hope they pay for it and not get their permit. Right on. Right on. Well, thank you guys for spending your Wednesday before Thanksgiving evening hanging out with us. <laughs> it's always good to see your faces. So Liz, question for you. Mm -hmm. After the king tides, was there um, uh, more debris washed up on the shores out in the beaches or was there any um, indication of that the heavier tides brought in more debris? That's a great question. I'm gonna turn that one to Lee. Yeah, I, I was kind of hoping to get to talk, to the, talk about this. So um, about six months ago, I started walking the beaches around Grayland quite a bit and I noticed there's foot long pieces of plastic poly rope everywhere. Um, and, 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 and they go all the way up to the North Coast, these pieces like foot long pieces of braided plastic rope and they come from the oyster industry because when they do long line oyster culture, they haul in the, the oysters are grown on the, on the plastic ropes 
and after two years of being out in the tidelands, they haul them in on, on barges and then they cut the sections of rope that about a foot apart and then they bring them into a processing plant. And to try to make a, a long story short, they end up crushing or removing the meat of, from the oysters and then crushing or piling up all these shells and the ropes. And then they bring the, the ropes the shells and the ropes back out to the tide flats and they grow rows of oysters that they harvest with a, a dredge. So those yellow ropes are for, for probably 40 years have been put, put back out with the shells. And so those ropes eventually, um, be, because of ocean current currents and, and most of this happens in Willapa Bay because, um, because that's where they where they do the most long line oyster culture. So that ends up traveling north onto the beaches um, um, north of Tokeland. And um, just in the last couple of weeks since that king tide, uh, a pair of volunteers collected in in one pass of a one mile long transect, they picked up almost two thousand ropes, and then. Just a couple days ago, we have one of our coworkers is 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 trying to get volunteers to help. You know, to because every day more more of the ropes come in with the, with the high tide. So they collected another couple thousand. Um, so that's what to in just the last week since the since the king tides, they collected about four thousand one foot long pieces of yellow plastic rope and and all kinds of other stuff too but we're working with the oyster industry to to try to find to try to inspire them to stop that practice or to remove the ropes from the oyster the piles of shells before they put it back out in the in the tidelands and 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 i think in general those king tides do bring up a lot more plastic and it's not just the yellow ropes it's it's all kind you know it's nets it's oyster bags it's you know all kinds of aquaculture stuff plus the regular um plastic bottles that we send bottle caps and lighters and you know all that stuff that is that we see that's been in the ocean for years great question <laughs> yeah and there's another king tide around the middle of december yep yeah. So if anyone wants to come out and count foot long pieces of yellow ropes, it's actually kind of fun. It's very satisfying. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that answer. Sure. And I put a link to the blog post about King Tides because um, Surfrider, we partner with um, Washington Sea Grant to capture images of King Tides to help promote action on coastal resilience in response to climate change and sea level rise because King Tides are a great way to sort of envision what our future is going to be like with rising tides. And so um, if you're ever out, please <clears throat> safely capture images of king tides, especially when they're like coming up on infrastructure or, um, you know, compared to some sort of, you know, monument or um, you know, visible structure of some kind. Um, we, that's really valuable for us. So I put a link there that shows you, that tells you how to submit those, those images. Um, there's even an app on your phone called My Coast where you can just take it and it geolocates it and automatically uploads it, so. Wrong link for the king tide? Oh, you're right, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> I put the wrong link for the king tide. <laughs> Here's the right one, there you go. Uh, right on, I'm trying to think of any last minute updates. Does anybody have any fun life events they wanna share? So I can live vicariously through you because I'm just hanging out at home, my chickens. <laughs> Are we? Did we decide that there's no, there is no December meeting, correct? Uh, December chapter. We were debating because um, you had mentioned playing like some Jackbox games. Yeah, so right, right. It might be fun. It's on the thirtieth. Would be when our meeting would be. Um, yeah. So I would be fine to like, like I'm going to be alone with you know with my chickens at my house. I'm sure still by then. So. I would be down to like do like some just game night or something super low key and chill. Um, I don't know if that's like a paid thing, but yeah, yeah. I'll, try, I'll, I'll, I'll keep working on that. 
All right. That's the new yeah, I'd be up for that too, but could take it or leave it. So whatever. Yeah. The yeah majority decides guys. I mean, I figure we'll all be on like a four day binger around the hot, the new year. Right. <laughs> yeah. In the depths. Whiskey egg. Yeah. So I think that's the goal. Yeah. And then we'll have some annual planning coming up in probably January or so. Um, and there'll probably be a little bit more in the way of like activist training um, in preparation for the legislative session. Um, I do want to say if anybody's interested in virtual lobby day, environmental lobby day and ocean, ocean recreation uh, hill day, um, normally Surfrider sends volunteer leaders um, from all over the nation to DC to lobby um, on the hill, the Capitol, um, for our oceans. And so this year it's virtual, um, which is, you know, it is what it is. Nobody wants to spend that much time on a screen. Uh, and my heart goes out to all the legislators that have to spend those time in Zoom meetings. But the good news is nobody has to travel to do it. And so it's a lot more accessible. And so we're hoping to get a lot of volunteers all over the states to, um, to, lo to lobby. And so if that interests you, um, we'll probably be doing some trainings and some onboardings. Um, and yeah, just, just email me if that's something you'd be, you'd be into. Is am I allowed to do that as a state worker? Mm, I think so. Just thought I'd check with you. I think so. I'll, I'll ask Gus. Not the Gus. I would think so. Yeah. I think as long as you don't wear your, your DFW hat and you're like, I'm just here as a citizen. Don't wear like a logo. Keep <laughs> your Glock at home. She doesn't have a Glock. It'd be funny if she did that. <laughs> Do you, how does it work again? Do they uh, uh, sort of assign you to a certain uh, subject and then you, you talk, you, you sort of lobby for that or how does that work? I don't know because I've never done it. <laughs> this would be, this would be all the uh, best questions. He's the policy probably, guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm a sort of science nerd. I'm like, let me tell you about a deep sea critter I learned about. Um, yeah. water keeper, the, the Washington water keepers have a lobby day each year and they, um, some of the, the organizers of it get talking points already and then they have a schedule and they give out a schedule and, and, and like tell you which aides or which legislators you're going to work with. And so, oh, yeah. so okay. all the people that have signed up for it kind of have a, it, an agenda. And yeah. Yeah. That sounds like what, what Gus and those guys do also, actually. Yeah, we would, no, we no. would prepare you. I mean, yeah. maybe not I. I don't, I don't <laughs> just know what we We're not just going to throw you in and be like, I just Zoom bomb the federal legislative session <laughs> um, with your, your pro-ocean bullet point. You know, so no, you'd be prepared. And I think Resource yeah. Media is one of our big partners that provides a lot of really good trainings on communications and stuff. And so um, my guess is they probably designed some sort of preparatory core, you know, there's a lot of resources out there that we would share with you so that you would be comfortable with it. Yeah. I would want to, cause I'm not comfortable. <laughs> I'd be like, no, do I have to wear shoes? I don't wanna... When I've done it in the past, they usually choose just a people to speak. Yeah. So they like the numbers there so that the Congress people can see that, that there might be a lot of people present but usually there's only one or two people who speak and then they usually only have a minute anyway on a specific topic that, that has been chosen. There you go. Once I did it and I, and I um, accidentally, I put my age in because I was trying to make a big point and I actually put myself in as being five years older than I was. <laughs> and I, I read it back afterwards and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just like aged myself five years. They must have thought I looked so good for my I wife. know. <laughs> What's her It was very silly. Nice. All you Pacific Northwesterners age better than us Southerners. <laughs> so I feel like most people I meet out here that are from here, like, I think they're 10 years, 15 years younger than they are. So. Beautiful people, all of you. <laughs> Thanks, Liz and Lee. You're welcome. It, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Good to yeah, know. Good to have some like human interaction.
Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Have a great nice holiday, day. guys. Bye, Bye Ryan. Be Very nice to see you. Care. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, see you guys. Thanks. If anybody wants to hang out and talk about EC stuff, happy to do so. Oh, hey, Liz, I got a question for you. Do Are it. you going to be, uh, is there any way I could pick up a t-shirt or two tomorrow? Yes. Somehow? Yes. I'm getting, we're, we're actually going to see Stacy and her uh, family tomorrow. The, Stacey, yeah. the tattoo artist. So I was going to give her one. Yeah, totally. I'll be here all day. All day, every day. Never go anywhere. <laughs> Probably in my PJs. Right. So, so yeah, for sure. Did we get um, t-shirts made for the chickens? Huh? Did what? we get t-shirts made for the chickens? No. They don't. T-shirts. They don't actually. Just, well, they don't like wearing costumes. It's really disappointing. I keep <laughs> putting costumes Ooh. on them, and they, they reject them. Very frustrating. <laughs> Them. Thank you. Like Christine, you look idea. great. Huh? Yeah, Christine, how are you feeling? I know you have like look an Ellen DeGeneres to you, you right look now. Good. Yeah. It's good. It's looking good. It's, it's yeah. too great. But it, I have hair. And actually, most importantly, I have eyebrows. <laughs> These are important. <laughs> These are a few of my favorites. <laughs> it looks like yeah. platinum blonde. You do look plat. I thought you were yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were a movie star. <laughs> well, I think this is actually a good way for it to grow in because I actually tried a couple times because I knew my hair was graying and I had been dying it blonde and I just couldn't do it. So now I think I'm just going to leave it, save yeah. myself the money and, and just let it grow in kind of this salt and pepper. Now yeah. I really am. People pay money for that. I see young kids dyeing their hair gray. Kids these days. Yeah. So I'm excited for it to grow out more because I was told by so many people that it was going to grow back even curlier than it was before. So I'm hoping I'm going to have like maybe an Annie, you know, fro or something. That'd be great. That would be awesome. So we'll see. Right now it's a little bit annoying to live with Dave because it's so soft. That I'm just getting, Dave just is constantly rubbing my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, it's the chia pet effect, right? Yeah. It's like a hamster. It is pretty soft. <laughs> anyway, thanks, guys. How are you doing, Daryl? Hey, good. Yeah, I usually shave my head every April or May, but I didn't this last year. Yeah. With but yeah, every time I shave my head, um, it seems like you just get like 30% or 20% more uh, gray hairs in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So every time that, and it just gets thinner and thinner every year, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we all suffer. We all suffer the same woes. Time is a full <laughs> <cool> mistress. <sighs> yeah. So is anyone going anywhere in the next just a little Here. while? Yeah. 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 Probably better. Probably better that way. Yeah. We're making a lot of food, but we're not going anywhere. That's the best. <laughs> yeah. Then you just have it all for you to eat. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't have to worry about divvying any leftovers up or... Yeah. <laughs> I'm like a total hobbit and I eat like so much food and I get like really possessive about it. And <laughs> so like, like if somebody eats my Thai leftovers, so help you God. Like, <laughs> and it always tastes better the next day too. Ooh, somebody ooh. eats it and it's like, what? Our neighbors were like, come over for Thanksgiving dinner. And I was like, mm, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with that. Cause like, we're not supposed to, it feels hypocritical, yada, yada. And he's like, well, just come and grab food. I'm like, I'll come steal your food and leave with it. <laughs> That works. How big a plate? Is there a restriction on how big a plate I can bring? Like a pot? It's going to be like takeout. It's perfect. <laughs> exactly. Like free takeout. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. We'll give them some eggs. We got a lot of eggs. <laughs> Should be making deviled eggs. Ah, yeah. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> you just boil Jill, them. Jill, have you been to the, uh, to the coast? 
anytime recently? Have you I have not, but I'm going out next Wednesday. So hopefully the weather will be decent, but we've been kind of avoiding, well, trying to stay home and be good, but haven't been out yeah. much, but we'll go out next, next week. I have to go out there for a couple little weird things. So yeah. hopefully it'll the be decent. Been, yeah. The swell has just been gigantic and it's just oh, been really it? windy. windy. I don't know. I don't think anyone. I, I don't think I many people. Last uh, Saturday, it was it was really nice down the growings. Oh, Saturday. Yeah. yeah, but I think the swell was like an eight foot or something. You know, one of the smaller days. Mm. Oh yeah, the weather was yeah. beautiful on Saturday too. Yeah, it was, nice. it was absolutely yeah, gorgeous. Yeah. Jealous. I'm glad you got out. Nope. And I think this week weekend is look shaping up to look pretty, pretty nice as well. Yeah. And Friday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sure. That'd be so nice. nice. I think we're going to Port Angeles. Oh, yeah. fun. Yeah. What are you doing? Just hanging? Uh, well, there's this, when the surf is this big uh, in Westport, generally it's surfable at multiple places near Port Angeles. So we take the van hmm. up there and uh, camp. And my parents also live in Port Angeles and have a totally detached mother-in-law apartment house. So That's Joe's awesome. getting to the point at seven months pregnant, uh, sleeping in the van doesn't have the same allure as it used to. So <laughs> weird to imagine. Can yeah, you have like a hammock? Would a hammock? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I don't think that's good. Uh. Yeah. There's nothing natural about pregnancy and childbirth. I'm I'm convinced. Just a couple good friends that are like going through it right now, and it's just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> and and there's still you just can't believe there's still two months to go. You're just like, oh my god. Like how huge can you get? I don't envy. Do not envy her. Well, you better be like it rubbing goes, her feet and bringing her ice packs. Yeah. And it goes oh, yeah. fast before you know it. What What was that, Daryl? Oh, you, you get to sleep right now, right? Yeah. 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 Daryl's like, you don't even know what's coming. Yeah, yeah I get it. Was, it was, our yeah. first born, it took like a year of sleep training, man. Some people, it's like four there's, months. There's no sleep training. We're still sleeping. Yeah, we're still sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years old, yeah. Oh, man. That's awesome. It's going to be an exciting yeah. adventure. Does Joe surf, Joe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Not right now, I'm guessing. No, no, it's, it's impossible. Physically impossible. She's too, like when You're her body's a wet suit. too far to like paddle. Yeah. Maternity wetsuit, be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot, there's, there you go. You get some shade. You bet. That's you cut, the, cut the center out of it or something. Yeah. <laughs> This is so cold. I'm gonna Google images <laughs> right now because I I need to know. About that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like the idea. This uh, idea of uh, doing the, you know, our planning get together. We should really sketch out some uh, all contribute ideas before that. Like have a a pre planning meeting so that we just really go into it with a lot of good solid ideas and such. Okay. Yeah, is that more of a like strategic planning for what for like campaigns or what's kind of the So it just it's just sort of like a long term like a deeper EC meeting of like what is what is our plan like a year long strategy. And so usually you spend like 4 hours and you get at least like the six the first 6 months like kind of booked out as far as like who your presenters are going to be and you know, if you have a budget, like, what is your budget and what are you going to do with that? Um, and then, you know, sort of identify some goals that you can kind of keep working towards. And so it's just, you know, a long-term strategy meeting that we try to get chapters to do. Um, and it's always, it's always helpful and effective. Um, but I do think that after like six or seven months, like, if you don't revisit it, and that's something I want to try to get all of the chapters to start doing is like halfway through the year or maybe even quarterly, like spend an EC meeting, like reading through and sort of checking in because it's a lot of time and energy gets spent and you come up with these great plans and then like life happens and things, you know, you they drop off and you forget to check like what the goals were and stuff. And so 
um, they all tend to kind of like fizzle out by the end of the year, it seems like. And I feel like we always have like, okay, we got a presenter series like booked for the first six months. And then like the second half of the year, they're like, oh, what are we doing now? Like month by month, they're like, what are we doing next month? Shit, I don't know. You know, so it's, it tends to be like a lot more scrambling towards the end of the year, which is just, I think, the way of, the way of things. But um, so yeah, that's, that's the plan. And if there is a campaign we want to identify and work on, like for sure, we could get that in there. We could probably do it in like, depending on how like the whole vaccine thing rolls out, like it's possible we could do it safely in person, um, you know, and still be compliant with all the like safety rules, depending on how like the new year's goes. I don't know this holidays, it might, everything might be really, really messed up and cases are going to explode because it's the holidays. So yeah, who knows? So I think at some point we should figure out, like, we should maybe just set a date for like when we would want to have it ideally and like plan for it in person and then like set a date where we like make the call of like, are we going to punt it another month or two to like see if COVID gets better or just like commit to virtual. So that might be yeah. something to think about as far as planning, <laughs> coming up with a, an idea. So we could do it right now if y'all wanted to. Did you, yeah, did you guys pick a date when you had the meeting? No. Usually we do it the beginning of January, like that first week, don't we? Like in place of the EC meeting, kind of? Yeah. Yeah, so. for that month, yeah. Like January 9th? Do we do it that early? Maybe. Do we want to do it on the Saturday? Saturday's usually like unfortunately it's gonna have to be a weekend just because yeah. it's a long meeting and it's long, yeah. People. Well it's funny, my calendar's totally free. <laughs> <laughs> well it's my job, so I can do it midday if you guys want. <laughs> I'm fine, but all you working people. Yeah, I mean around that the, the beginning of January kind of makes sense to me. I mean sounds Do y'all like, wanna set like a, a tentative date of like January 9th, which is the second Saturday? Yeah, that I think that works. Okay. Yeah. But like, just don't plan anything for that weekend, and let's plan on maybe doing a an in person one. I don't know. What do you guys think? I don't. I'm fine with virtual. It sucks being on a virtual meeting for like four hours, but we can take breaks. What are you guys comfortable with? Well, why don't we plan in person and then if there's still restrictions and kind of how things look at the, you know, a couple weeks out, if we have to switch it to Zoom, we, it's an easy change to go that way probably than the other. Okay. Let's plan that. All right, let's do that. I'll make a, I'll share a calendar invite. So it's, we'll plan on like a half day. What do you guys think? Like a 10 to 2 with a lunch break or do you want to do like a morning sesh, an afternoon sesh? Yeah, well, you know, if we do, if we try to plan it in person, you know, Three Magnets does have that big open space where we could, I think I remember looking at the pictures that their picnic tables are pretty big, so we could still kind of sit far apart. And then if you do it for a lunch, then we can order lunch because we'll be there. Have they covered? Yeah, they're, no. they're, they're big covered space. It looks like a whole nother I don't know where it is though. Oh good, down that, probably down the alleyway maybe? I know, I was there the summer sitting outside and they had the tables all along that kind of in between, yeah. kind of in between yeah, they the put two up buildings. Big, so if it being covered, it that's big, huge. Heaters and, yeah. Oh yeah, that would be perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's, let's plan, <laughs> and you wanna do like a morning, COVID! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> Do we want to plan like a morning, like a brunch, or like an afternoon, or like like? Oh, I, I like your maybe eleven, maybe eleven to whatever it was. Okay, like eleven to three. I think we usually do yeah. like four hours. Okay, eleven to three, three magnets, and then if we end up doing a thing on the thirtieth, um, just sort of make the call then and be like, all right, are we gonna? do this in person and I think we'll have a much better idea because it'll be like post holiday season at that point. So that'll be our decision date.
Sure. Cool. Sounds good. Right on. Thanks yeah, for, uh, thanks for hanging in there, Carol. If you want. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> thanks what? for sticking around. But I, I was just say, saying thanks for to Daryl for uh, hanging it. Hanging oh in. yeah, no problem. I well, I was going to talk about being it or doing the EC thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what kind of questions do you have? Well, I was going to join or um, join it. I don't know how to do that or what I got to do to do that. Well, what would you uh, like? Uh, what, tell somebody. us what your interests are, because we have a couple positions, and so. What are they? What are the positions? So we have a treasurer um which is pretty low key and low barrier because we're not spending any money or buying things or anything right now um and so they usually just sort of manage the bank account um and are responsible for like quarterly reporting where you just fill out a spreadsheet in our google drive and then the headquarters kind of reviews it kind of thing um and then we also have a volunteer coordinator um so that's a really essential position um, that tends to pick up a lot more in the summer when we have more in-person events going on. Um, but they tend to be in charge of monitoring the emails and responding to inquiries and sort of plugging people into different uh, programs and campaigns that we have. Um, so like, I, that's what the role I was before I got hired as staff and so technically cannot volunteer. Um, and so sort of managing and coordinating a Blue Water Task Force program that we have in the summer um, and then beach cleanups. And we can also, there are also like extra positions outside of the usual ones. Um, so if you know you just wanted to do Blue Water class, Task Force or just wanted to organize beach cleanups um, or just work on like communications. Um, so it's basically like what, what floats your boat? What would you well, be happy I could start if you said treasure sounds like the easiest, right? Yeah, but like my son, my, like my son always says, I'll will do the easiest one, you know. But <laughs> that'd be, that's I'll do awesome. that, and then um, when the the blue is it called Blue Water Task Force? When mm -hmm. that starts, I might be interested in some of that too. All right, yeah, sounds great. That's a, that that sounds perfect to me, Daryl. Because the reality is, we we you know we have these official positions, but we're really just everyone's just kind of doing whatever they yeah. can to make it work. So it's just, I think that's just, it's a perfect way to start. And then you can just kind of see how things work and what you're interested in. And um, like Liz said, when you, if, if you start getting really interested in taking some specific thing uh, in a direction or to the next level, and uh, then, you know, it's more power to you. So, yeah. We just, you know, want you to do what you want to do to, to help the oceans and coasts. So, so yeah, typically, I do stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah, we, we all do each other's work for each other. We all do stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so typically the, the way it usually works in normal times is we would like announce to the membership that we're going to have elections and then we'd have like a public meeting election. Um, so it's all like transparent. And so people are, you know, involved and their, their voices are heard. Right now, because of how weird everything is, it's sort of just like, we could probably just vote you in right now if you wanted to, like, it's up to, it's up to you, like when you wanted to sort of step into the role or if you want me to like share like the onboarding resources with you to like look over. Um, so I'll leave it up to you, honestly, because we're chill okay. here in our tiny chapter. Yeah, I'll take the Putin route. I'll just have you guys put me on in. <laughs> right That's a good on. idea. Well, that works for me. <laughs> Good. I, we can just I like second vote. that. I second. Oh, I'm not, a, I'm not a voting member. Sweet. Second. <laughs> Welcome <Third>. aboard. <laughs> Merry Good, thing Good thing there's no competition to to poison. There's tons of competition. They're all special. We've turned away so many treasures. No, no, that's super exciting. Um, yeah, I'm happy. I will share some resources with you. I can't promise it won't be until next week. So I'm probably gonna not check my email for a few days if I can avoid it. Um, but I will, yeah, I'll share all the resources. There's definitely just a couple documents that you, you know, we ask you to read through just so you're aware of how things work. Um, and then there's, there's a treasurer training that kind of walks you through sort of 
the things that you'd be required to do. It's all pretty, pretty low barrier stuff. So, um, and I'm always here Does, to answer any questions. Yeah, the, the treasurer part will involve just uh, getting, you have to be officially established as, as a signer on the account, which is kind of a process. So, but we can yeah. figure that out. And then you basically, you would basically have the, the official chapter credit card and, and access to the uh, account. And then generally at the beginning of every EC meeting, we have like a, like a, just a report of how much money has been spent, if any. Uh, and that's really, that's really about the extent of it. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. It, would, it would be, it would be helpful. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, it'd be great to have you. Cool. Yeah, sorry, I mute a lot. My kids will come running by. <laughs> <every> <laughs> <once>. <laughs> they're so cute. I love their little faces. Like they pop up, like they're smiling yeah. on you. Yeah, they're really into the um, sea animals or different animals and stuff. So this, they think this is pretty cool. Nice. Well, fun fact, one of my chapters, I think it's um, the Tacoma chapter, asked me to give a presentation on Mola Molas next year. So oh, nice. February. Oh, my favorite. I know. I was like, I don't, I don't know why you guys are asking this, but like, <laughs> yes. So Ocean Sunfish, February. It's going to happen. I'm excited. Did they, did they recently catch one again in a super weird place, I thought I read? I don't know. Like in a, like in a yeah, it was like in a really cold off the coast of Oregon or something, I thought. So I'll make sure you know, your kids can tune into that if, uh, if I give a whole, a whole lecture on the weirdest sea creature that exists. <laughs> weirdest fish. Leah's, Leah's doubting it. There are weirder sea creatures. That's true. Seen a nudibrank? <laughs> Nudibranks are great. I'm pro, I'm pro nudibrank for sure. I love nudibrank. One of my best friends, I call him my illegitimate brother. He's like a PhD and he studies nudibranchs. And I used to go slug hunting for him. Like I got paid to go on slug hunts because there's an endemic species in the Keys. And so when I lived in the Keys, I'd be like, I was there. She's like, hey, I need a hundred slugs. I'm like, I'm on it. <laughs> and I'd mail him <laughs> slugs. It was fun. Fun, nice. fun science. Well, right on. Well, it was great to see you guys. Are we going to do a meeting on December 9th? Oh, yeah, that's a good call. Just really quick, oh. sorry. I do have to, to get out of here, but I just wanted to know if I should prepare an agenda for that day. What do you guys think? Normally we do like a holiday party. Yeah, I kind of thought we were going to, I guess I thought that. Maybe 30th. we do either the 9th or the 30th, kind of pick one or the other and open it up. Okay. I would I vote the 30th. Yeah. That's thoughts. Yeah. That sounds good. We'll stick with the 30th. Yeah. Okay. I got a okay. lot going on that week. I'm freaking out. 30th. <laughs> right on. All right, Daryl, I will send you an email with a bunch of stuff um, at for you to peruse at your leisure. Um, and definitely don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions about it. Um, and we will add you to the uh, email threads that we bop around, if that is okay with you. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Oh, his phone awesome. number. We need his phone number. Oh yeah, we need your deets. Oh, I need my, okay. And you get a red cap and a Speedo <laughs> and a Glock. Oh, and you'll need a bio for Christine to put up on Instagram to make it official. Oh yeah, we need oh, okay. Can you give me your vote, your phone number really quick and I'll just add you to our group text? Yeah, it's 360-490-8889. Thanks, Daryl. Yep. Are uh, you thanks, okay guys. with like group texts and email yeah. threads? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'll just turn it off if it's, you know, and then <laughs> Glad okay. to be um, Yeah, have fun up in Port Angeles, Joe. Thanks. I Thanks. wish I was going up there. Get Joe to take some pictures of you surfing. Should be nice. Okay. All right. See what we can do. <laughs> it is. It should be nice. I mean, the the uh, there's starting to be snow on the on the mountains on the other side of the uh, straits. So, on a nice clear day, you, you can be surfing with literally like snow capped 
peaks yeah. in the background. It's pretty, it's very yeah. Northwest. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> the Floridian in me is like, that's not right. It's not right. The, the epitome of cold water surfing. So awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to go eat right. dinner because I'm a hot. Enjoy the holidays. Take Bye. care. Bye, everybody. Nice to see you. Bye. 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 Bye.